The darkest depths of the sea hold a secret, shrouded in mystery and fear. Beyond the protection of this cage lurks a leviathan, rarely seen and studied only at great peril. Scientists struggle to unravel its secrets, but until now, it has remained beyond their reach. To reveal the truth behind this master of the sea will require unconventional research, and an unconventional researcher, someone willing to venture beyond the limits of conventional science to meet white sharks outside the cage. Swimming outside of a cage, it's a method by which I can approach the sharks, I can move with them. Don't try this at home. What they're doing is ballsy. I think it's kind of stupid, frankly. There is very few ways to study anything that you're not going to affect it just by your presence. That's so much power, and they're so unpredictable that it's, I think, much safer from the deck of a boat. I mean, everybody's going to take shots at you. That's kind of the name of the game, and that's how science progresses. You are given a, a window of opportunity to watch and record what the sharks are doing with each other. I'm there to learn about the shark. Dyer Island off the coast of South Africa. Here, cold currents from deep in the South Atlantic surge towards the coast, carrying nutrient-rich water that supports a profusion of marine life. A small island to the south is the home of one of the largest Cape fur seal colonies in the world. Attracted by the rich waters, these seals live and breed on the windswept island, supporting in turn one of the largest populations of great white sharks in the world. The green channel that runs between the islands is their hunting ground. It is known as Shark Alley. Scientists flock to this white shark headquarters, but there is one researcher who stands out from the rest. In his quest to uncover the secret world of these primal predators, he challenges the Hollywood image of sharks as merciless killers. His name is Mark Marks. This isn't um, a job, really. For me, it's more of a lifelong goal. Essentially, we're talking about learning uh, the behavioral ecology of an animal. Risks will be taken. But Mark is on a mission to use his scientific skills, both conventional and unconventional, to reveal the true nature of the white shark. Look at these sharks. They're not the big man-eaters of jaws. But getting into the water and swimming with a white shark without having years of experience in first studying their behavior is foolhardy. Marx began his research in the traditional way, observing what he could from the safety of a shark cage and a small boat. However, he soon became frustrated with being able to see only a small fraction of the white shark's behavior in the murky water. He knew that he would have to get closer to his subjects, much closer. Mark recalled an early encounter with white sharks. He was still at school and had gone diving with some friends off the coast of California. So my first encounter with a white shark outside of a cage was pseudo-intentional. And it was another one of these, you turn and everything happens. And there it was, this white shark cruising above me, but at distance, moving. And I was just like, <gasps> it was so much that I didn't even think to take the photos. I was just, oh my God, shark. And as I'm thinking, I got to get a shot of this, I start bringing my camera up. And as I do, the second shark moves in. I brought the camera up and I just started firing. Bang, 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 until I was out. And then I sat there and I just, I watched these two sharks just swim by, have a look and leave. Encouraged by this initial experience, Mark began to consider the unthinkable. What would happen if he left the cage?
He knew that his ideas were untried and probably dangerous, but to the amazement of other researchers, he began to study his subjects from outside the cage, though cautiously at first unsure of how they would react. To his surprise, the sharks did not attack. Instead, they appeared curious, intent on watching this strange new creature. At first, he stayed close to the cages, but with each new experience, his confidence grew, and he slowly ventured further and further from their protection. The results were breathtaking. Before long, he was interacting with the most feared killer in the sea, swimming so close that he could almost reach out and touch them. thing that held Mark's back was the limitations of snorkeling. He could stay with the sharks only for as long as he could hold his breath. He needed to find another way. Developed by the military, the rebreather presented exciting new opportunities. It works by collecting the exhaled breath of the diver so that he doesn't produce noisy bubbles that might frighten the sharks. The used air is then passed through a chemical compound that removes excess carbon dioxide and adds oxygen. The oxygen-rich air then passes back to the diver. This meant that he could spend longer underwater without scaring his subjects. The rebreather is another tool that enables Marks to unlock the secrets of the little known world of the white shark. What it gives you is the ability to operate like a, a marine organism, a, to have gills. It takes away variables in the science. It takes away all the sound that is produced by using scuba. A rebreather will give me up to six hours of breathing time in the appropriate conditions. I'm able to play on the same field as them. And uh, the more variables you can cut out, the more sure that you're not biasing your research. I'm trying to be as unbiased as I can. Uh, plus, they're a lot of fun, to be honest. The great white shark conjures up images in our collective imagination of violent killing machines. A power-driven mouthful of razor-sharp teeth The ancestors of the white shark watched Tyrannosaurus rex come and go, and yet we know more about the long extinct dinosaurs than we do about the white shark. One thing we do know is that
that the image of Carcharodon carcarius is something that terrifies us. There's always danger. I think built up from when I was a kid, you know, with Jaws and everything. There's a um, automatic fear, but fascination with great white sharks. For generations, we have been bombarded with images of blood and torn flesh, fueling a cruel, merciless image of the white shark. When you say great white shark, the first thing that comes to my mind is the movie Jaws, <laughs> unfortunately, but I remember seeing it when I was much younger, and to this day, it's had an effect on the water sports I do, which is pretty much non-existent, because um, I'm afraid of them. I have a lot of respect for sharks. I wouldn't be hunting them, but I, I wouldn't want to be in the wrong place at the wrong time with a great white. The number of people entering the world's oceans is increasing and encounters with white sharks are therefore more frequent. But even those who spend a lot of time in the water run a greater risk of being struck by lightning, killed by a bee sting, or eaten by an alligator than being attacked by a white shark. I think of a great white shark, I think of Jaws. Even so, the image of a wickedly grinning white shark is ever present, swimming through our subconscious. No other creature on Earth arouses such powerful fears as the white shark. Our feelings are so deeply ingrained that the truth is usually overlooked. I think they like to eat people. I think the reason why I'm, I'm afraid of them is that I always think negative. Slowly, however, a new image is emerging. What I think about great white sharks is that I think they're very Magnificent. An image to replace the monsters of our imagination. I think great white sharks are, are, look really, really cool, but they're not really mean to people. They can be nice too. This image is gradually being shaped by the efforts of a few researchers, like Mark Marks, challenging our old stereotypes. I think it's cool when the white shark is, it's a really neat creature and we have to learn more about it, not just it's an eating machine. These new ideas provide exciting opportunities to unlock the secrets of this mysterious predator. Carcharodon carcarius, white pointer, tommy shark, white death, great white. By any name, the image of a triangular dorsal fin cutting the surface is feared worldwide. At just over six meters or 20 feet long, the great white shark is one of the largest fish in the world. And yet it is very poorly known. Now we are starting to see that far from the primitive killing machines of tradition, they are more complex than we could have ever imagined. Large and inquisitive, they have highly developed senses and are keenly aware of their surroundings. They have a highly developed sense of smell. Water drawn in through their nostrils flows over sensitive membranes that can detect even the most minute traces of blood. Sharks often swing their heads from side to side as they swim to check which nostril has the stronger scent. This stereo sense of smell enables the shark to hone in accurately on its prey from a distance. White sharks can cover huge distances in their search for food. Their streamlined bodies are powered by a thick, muscular tail. When it has located its prey, the shark prepares to bite. The large triangular teeth are perhaps the great white shark's most readily identifiable feature each edged with rows of tiny serrations, perfectly designed for shearing through flesh. The teeth are arranged in rows one behind the other, and as one is lost, another will roll forward to replace it. 
one set of jaws can contain up to 70 teeth. The shark's skin is very sensitive to touch, especially along its flanks, in an area known as the lateral line, a gelatinous-filled canal that can detect vibrations with remarkable accuracy. The shark also has a well-developed sense of taste, using its mouth rather like a hand to examine its prey. This ability to distinguish between prey items may explain why shark attacks on humans don't always end in death. Perhaps its most remarkable adaptation is its eyes, which are among the most advanced of any fish. Uniquely for a fish, the shark can adjust its pupil to the available light. It can also focus its eye with specialized muscles which move the lens closer to or further from the light-sensitive retina at the back. The retina also has a layer of mirror-like plates that reflect and amplify light, helping the shark to hunt in the dark, murky water. Sharks don't have eyelids, so they protect their eyes by rolling them back in their sockets when they bite their prey. its strength and its highly developed senses, the great white shark is ready to hunt. Around Dyer Island, its preferred prey are the seals. The sharks slip quietly through the water, selecting the ideal target, then lunge forward, jaws agape. Although here seals are among their favorite prey, they will eat just about anything from abalone to dead whales. Despite all we have found out, we still have a limited understanding of the lives of these remarkable animals. This thirst for knowledge is what drives Marx in his research. Almost nothing is known about the social behavior of white sharks. Marx is among the first researcher to study their interactions to try to discover their secrets. But to do so, he has to enter, unprotected, the shark's domain. To spend time with such dangerous animals, he has to learn how to behave around them, to understand shark etiquette. He makes it look easy, but to observe these powerful, swift, and often unpredictable predators, he must try to avoid serious risks. He draws heavily on his own unmatched experience. When I'm under water, I try to address myself the same etiquette that white sharks use with one another. You know, and I think if you essentially behave yourself, so will they. I guess that's kind of where I get incensed is when I see normal people that don't work with the animal, perceiving it as something which it isn't. It's like lies that get perpetrated through myth. And I like the idea of setting records straight. One of the most important observations that Marx has made for his own safety is understanding the mechanics of the white shark's bite. His observations show that white sharks make exploratory bites as if they are using their mouths as a sensory organ. To help him in his research, Marx has developed a number of experiments to enable him to observe how the sharks themselves react to their own body language. 
To do this, he has to ensure that they can see themselves. He explains one of his inventions. Mirror board is essentially just that. It's a large mirror that allows the shark to come in, take a look, and for the first time see its own reflection. Spurred on by his success, he has developed some new and extraordinary tools. Then you bring in one of the largest displays we're aware of. White sharks, when they're so sorting themselves out during dominant aggression displays, they use what we call gape. That's a display of your weapons. So very similar to the way you operate the mirror board underwater, you get on the bottom, you wait till uh, a shark approaches, and then you give it a loud hello, and this is full gape, meaning full displaying of weapons. The varied reactions he has observed to his life-size cutout and to the mirror board convince Mark of a highly complex social world, previously unrecognized. Is there a pecking order among sharks? Why do some sharks become aggressive while others react in a more submissive manner? These are just some of the questions Marx hopes to answer. One of his newest experiments examines the hearing of sharks. By playing sounds of predator and prey species underwater and watching the sharks' reactions, Marx concludes that they have very good hearing and thinks that it might play an important role in their daily lives. Like all fish, sharks have no visible external ears, and for a long time their hearing was supposed to be rudimentary. But Marx suspects that it might be a vital means of detecting prey. Sharks have a well-developed inner ear, which is highly sensitive to low-frequency sounds, the kinds of sounds produced by injured fish and other marine animals. There are two tiny pores on the top of a shark's head that connect its inner ear to the outside. Inside the pores, there are three chambers containing nerve cells that can respond to sound vibrations. But it is the overlooked fourth chamber known as the macula neglecta that Marx believes holds the key. He thinks it is this tiny organ that provides the shark with instantaneous information about the source of the sounds that it hears. Audio playback for attracting sharks has been successful in the past. Um, it's been used limited with white sharks. We've had success using various sounds to attract white sharks and get their attention. Uh, some of these have been a variety of augmented low frequency emissions, but we've also had a lot of success using natural sounds produced by, for example, prey items like tuna and dolphin. So this afternoon, in lieu of, of a scent trail, we're gonna try to bring sharks in using sound. And in this case, we'll be using the sound of nursing bottlenose dolphins. The playback of different recordings we found elicits different responses and arrival times for the sharks. Right now we're playing dolphins, which are a natural prey item for white sharks, especially in the Mediterranean. But during the course of this study, we've experimented with a variety of different sounds, some of which have been to test how they would respond to, for example, a natural predator to the white shark, like the orca or killer whale. And we've used killer whale sounds uh, effectively to try to drive off the sharks and in some cases they've actually excited them. Maybe white sharks really don't separate the sound of an orca from that of any other dolphin and that just kind of excites them. We've also tried playback of various low frequency emissions such as those that would be produced by for example a struggling fish on a spear fisherman's line. All of these tend to have a different uh, response for the sharks and really we're still in the infancy of trying to determine how to best utilize this. Check it out, shark coming in. Well when the dolphins are running uh, we definitely have the sharks coming in so they're responding to the sound. The sounds are such a high stimulus that one shark returns unexpectedly surprising everyone on board.
Mark's research methods are dynamic, unique, and exciting. But are they good science? Sean Van Summerman. You need to look at sharks interacting and not with uh, supermarket mirrors. You know, you need to look at the sharks interacting with each other and you will see them interact with each other. I think the best way to do that is to study naturally occurring predatory events and see how the sharks, uh, you know, form a pecking order, how they, you know, take turns at the feeding event. Mirror boards are the simplest visual tool. Dr. Chris Lowe. Don't try this at home. Um, yeah, actually, a, a lot of the things that Mark is doing are, he's probably doing based on his experience and his personal knowledge and comfort in the water. But these are certainly not things that I would ever recommend for anybody else. Conducting this research outside the cage is probably no different than conducting it inside the cage. The cage in and of itself is probably affecting the animal's behavior. So being inside or being outside is probably not that big a difference. Um, from a safety standpoint, yeah, I mean, you're definitely more susceptible to getting bitten if you're outside the cage. But in terms of being able to get a really good indication of what's natural behavior, it's already kind of biased in the fact that you've got something in the water that's unnatural. For those scientists that choose not to venture outside their narrow, rigid, myopic box, um, I predict that they will go the, um, the same way as the dodo and the dinosaurs. It will only lead to extinction. Dr. Peter Klimley. Well, all it takes is one, one mistake, you know. So what they're doing is ballsy. I think it's kind of stupid, frankly, because I think that up, you know, in the end, it's going to catch up to them. I think maybe there's some uh, some information to be had, but it's a very risky way of doing it. It could be done remote sensing, boys. Remote sensing, that's the way they go. Something happens, it's really strange, when a good scientist decides he's going to work with white sharks after he's come from somewhere else. And all of a sudden, it has a lot more to do with ego than the actual science. Dr. Chris Lowe. Bickering's not uncommon. That happens all the time. And again, you know, people are territorial. Um, from the standpoint of who's right, I hate to say, but it's probably the person who spent the most time in the water with him. Dr. Heidi Dewar. He's got to be a little crazy. <sighs> There's no way in the world that you could get me in the water to tag a white shark. <sighs> Um, I, there are people who do get in the water with the animals, but that's so much power and they're so unpredictable that it's, I think, much safer from the deck of a boat. Sean Van Summerman. My first impression is that the, uh, the being in the water is simply kind of a sundry uh, daredevil, uh, you know, aspect to the uh, other half of the equation, which is, you know, getting answers to questions. The shark may respond to me being in the water, but you can't get around the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In fact, the observer may influence the experiment itself, but we try to reduce our impact as much as possible. In showing that gateboard and flashing it vertically to the shark, we're looking for subtle or very overt uh, displays that the shark will uh, perform that would you know, clearly say to us it's responding to that display, the, the weapons, versus the scientist showing it. Aware of his detractors, Marx continues to push the limits of studying white shark interactions and holds on to his belief that cages are not the best place for observation. If you're studying how sharks react to shark cages, that's a great, uh, great way to do it. One of his greatest frustrations is that while his critics spend their time and energy trying to convince the public that the white shark is not the mindless killer of legends and movies, they conduct their research as if it was just that. Despite the controversy, there is a growing community of researchers seeking to understand the world of the white shark. Under this cloud, this residue, of the old image of the white shark. So they sit here and they will tell you, we're trying to be unbiased and objective as possible. 
and yet you ask them, would you get in the water with a shark? And they'd say, hell no. Well, what that says to me is that they truly don't know the nature of these sharks. Yeah, it's risky. You can say hell no, and that's great because you're afraid of what might happen. But if you say hell no as a blanket cover because something will happen, well, then you're, you're really kind of portraying white shark in the hole's jaws image that they say they're trying to break. It's, a, it's an interesting contradiction. The ultimate goal of this research is to protect the species. Okay, girls. Dr. Heidi Dewar. If you want to protect something, the first thing you have to know is where it's going, what other fisheries it might be interacting with, or in whose country's water it's, it's swimming into. In an effort to answer these questions, researchers like Dr. Peter Klimley use the latest in satellite tracking to learn more about the nomadic white shark's movements. Well, I'm interested in understanding the behavior of, of, of sharks, and white sharks are very mobile, and it's really difficult to actually observe them. So, essentially, I place transmitters on the sharks which record aspects of their behavior. We know how fast the shark is swimming, and we know uh, the, its depth. And if we have that second internal transmitter in, we also have the temperature of his stomach that allows us to monitor the behavior of the sharks when they're underwater and you can't see them. As the study of the white shark continues, will standard research techniques provide all the answers? If not, will Mark's controversial experiments hold him back from mainstream research? Can the maverick scientists find common ground? Dr. Chris Lowe. There are two ways of doing things. You can um, forge your own path and buck the system, or you can work with the system. And, and I really think science progresses faster if people work in collaborative form. And that's, you know, being willing to, to be open to other people's ideas. I think the collaboration of shark researchers worldwide has already benefited um, educating the public, changing the image of sharks. So I think over time, um, by working together and by having a main focus of education, which many shark researchers make as their main focus, is how to get their information out to the general public to convince people that these aren't things that we need to be scared of, but they're things that we should be protecting. Despite the controversy, Marx and other researchers do agree that all studies from paleontology to physiology are essential to understanding and protecting the magnificent and enigmatic white shark. Cowboy or hardcore scientist, Mark's research is paying off. Already, his results are helping him to unravel the secrets of white shark behavior. His observations of sharks backing away from the gate board enabled him to understand what he observed when two sharks met. As they approached one another, they would bare their teeth, showing off their size and strength, and one would back away. By contrast, a shark watching its own body language in the mirror board responded by turning to one side. By presenting their sides, sharks can size one another up without confrontation. This behavior, called parallel swimming, can be seen when two sharks meet, passing each other side by side. Mark's findings seem to demonstrate that, contrary to popular belief, sharks are not unnecessarily aggressive towards one another. Instead, they have a complex hierarchy and social structure. Marx introduced a new tool to further his research, an underwater scooter. This allows him to follow the sharks away from the boats, bait, and cages to study their natural interactions. It also enables him to test their comfort zone. By staying nearby, 
he can find how close the shark will allow him to intrude upon its personal space. He finds that different sharks react in different ways when approached. Some respond with a behavior called a giveaway, conceding to the strange black creature, while others are spooked and simply disappear into the murk. Some of the animals are less intimidated, performing a parallel swim which enables Marks to travel right next to his 2,000 pound or 900 kilo subject. However, this new breakthrough also has its drawbacks. By moving further away from the cages, Marks increases his exposure. On his return, he sometimes becomes something of a moving target, attracting the attention of his subjects. On one occasion, Marx found himself in the middle of a game of tag in which two sharks would make passes at him from opposite directions. The game went on for nearly an hour. believes that these rarely observed interactions show highly advanced social behavior in white sharks. He also believes that observations like these can be made only from outside the cage. This is Rip Torn, named by Marx because of its distinctive scars. He quickly found that many of his subjects bore scars hinting at previous social encounters. well enough to identify individuals, he could see that each of them had a distinct personality. One of Mark's most extraordinary subjects is nicknamed Quasimodo, for obvious reasons. She has a deformation of the lower spine that she has probably survived since birth. She can't swim as fast as the other sharks, and yet she has grown very big and seems healthy. Her success raises interesting questions about sharks' social structures. Now this is a shark I've known over a number of years. She's quite an odd looking animal. And you can see there's plenty of evidence of social contact. All of those scars um, on her flank and towards her tail are scars from other sharks biting her, uh, but very controlled hits. Um, essentially, this shark, because of her gross deformity, you can see that there's no structure really giving that tail rigidity. Uh, she's probably uh, unable to catch a lot of the faster moving prey that white sharks might typically feed on. Quasimodo has become so successful socially in spite of her apparent physical handicap that she returns each year bigger and healthier. Alone, she would make a lifetime study.
the feeling is gradually growing in the scientific community that Mark's work is valid as part of a global effort to understand the place of the white shark in the marine ecosystem. As Dr. Chris Lowe explains. What Mark is doing is shedding a new light on sharks. And every day, that new light gets bigger and bigger and bigger. People are seeing that they're not these scary, dangerous animals that people once thought. Accidents do happen, and they probably will happen because we put more and more people in the water. So I think over time, um, by working together and by having a main focus of education, which many shark researchers make as their main focus, is how to get their information out to the general public to convince people that these aren't things that we need to be scared of. Through studies, even like what Mark is doing, is shedding a new light on sharks. And every day, that new light gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Dr. Heidi Dewar. I think that the, the work that people do that's not necessarily the hardcore science has a place also. It can be really important PR. It's, Good for letting people know, you know, what white sharks are up to, and hopefully dispelling some of the the fear fears about them. As word of Marks and other researchers' success spread, it inevitably began to attract attention. Filmmakers, thrill seekers, and eco tourists all flocked to Dyer Island for the chance of a once-in-a-lifetime encounter with the world's deadliest predator. Mark's success became his downfall. Soon the waters around Dyer Island were overcrowded with people baiting the sharks to draw them in close. Baiting provided chances to photograph the fearsome man-eater, bringing good business to boat operators. But all the activity in the water has altered the shark's behavior making behavioral research impossible. It's a frustrating setback after six years of painstaking work. But Mark's passion spurs him on. To continue his research, he needs to find a new, undisturbed version of Dyer Island. The island of Guadalupe, off the coast of Mexico. The water temperature, the prevailing currents, and the rich variety of prey species all suggest that this island will be at least as productive as those off South Africa. Furthermore, lying roughly 200 miles or 320 kilometers offshore, it should be beyond the reach of most tourists. For Mark Marx, it's time to leave Dyer Island. But it is not the end of his lifelong passion to study the Great White. It's in his blood. But what is it that draws him to take such great risks to understand the white shark? He recalls an incident from his childhood. He saw a commercial fisherman hauling in a shark and beating it to death. It had a profound effect on him, and from then on he sought to understand and protect this magnificent animal. 30 years down the road, and I now realize in retrospect what a profound moment that was that I witnessed the, the shark being brutally murdered. It essentially... Um, chose a path for me. I've spent the last 30 years focusing on trying to understand what the dynamic is between humans and shark. Here was an animal that had brought me so much joy. I've spent the majority of my life trying to understand what the shark is and uh, how it and human beings interact. Though the work of scientists and conservationists like Marx has already done a lot to raise public awareness and to protect sharks, they still face serious threats. Perhaps the most gruesome is the shark finning industry. 
Big catcher boats bring in millions of sharks whose fins are hacked off before the animals, still alive, are thrown back overboard as rubbish. The sheer waste doesn't bear thinking about. Yet more research into their ecology will be needed to save all sharks from extinction, including this, the ocean's greatest predator. What's so sexy about a shark, especially the white shark? The fact that it has the ability of doing to a human being what's in our worst subconscious nightmare, you know, consuming you alive. Well, that's pretty hyped. Yeah, they can do it. Is it dangerous to swim outside a cage with the white sharks? Well, of course it's dangerous. That isn't to say that it can't be achieved. And if you begin to decode white shark etiquette, then you can move amongst these animals. That being said, they're never 100% predictable. Despite the risks, Mark Marks and the other dedicated researchers continue exploring and asking questions in the hope of a brighter future for these wonderful denizens of the deep. What is the nature of the animal? It's, it's easy to say, oh, it's a top predator, you know, it calls the old, the weak, and, and to talk the whole genetic thing. Well, you can apply that to almost any predator. This animal is much more complex behaviorally than anyone has ever said. You try to stay detached from your subjects, uh, and, and that means hands off. I, my job is to be an observer and to uh, facilitate these experiments. But sometimes uh, it's not about science. Uh, you know, and here, it, it's that draw. As a human being, you want to reach out and just feel it, just touch it. And that, that's what that stroke is about. It's, um, it has nothing to do about science. It's, uh, it's more of a, an ethereal communicating with another animal. Um, it just feels really good. With the passion of researchers like Mark Marks on its side, the white shark the world's greatest predator is in good hands.